This is Lviv, a national, cultural, educational and scientific center of Ukraine. Situated in the western part of the country, with more than a millennium of history as a settlement, and over seven centuries as a city, Lviv had been part of numerous states and empires, including Kiev and Rus, Halic Volhynia, Poland, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, Austro Hungarian Empire, the short lived West Ukrainian People's Republic, then Poland again then the Soviet Union, and now finally, it's a part of modern-day Ukraine. This tumultuous history is the result of Lviv being situated at the crossroads of many trade routes and in the center of Europe. Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, is about 466 kilometers northeast, which is actually a little bit further than the historically intertwined capital of Poland, which is just some 350 kilometers northwest. Lviv boasts about being the most European Ukrainian city, and for good reason, for it has always been quite progressive. The first book printed in Ukraine, the first university in Ukraine, the first professional theatre, the first hotel, the first monument, the first press, the first railway, and most importantly, the first brewery. For today, while walking through the UNESCO World Heritage Old Town of Lviv, you are likely to encounter enough microbreweries to make a hipster blush. So let's take a journey to the very beginning. Who were the original settlers of this region? How did the connections to Poland and Austria come about? Why are so few Poles living there today? Why is the city a part of Ukraine? And what is life like in modern Lviv? Let's roll. Recent archaeological excavations show that the area of Lviv has been populated since at least the 6th century and was settled by Lendians, a West Slavic tribe since the 9th century. During the 10th and 11th centuries, the region, while being a sort of border between the Kingdom of Poland and Kiev and Rus, was referred to as Chervan cities, and both Kiev and Rus and Poland claimed it. Chervan cities were conquered by Volodymyr the Great and came under the rule of Kiev and Rus. The Kingdom of the Rus was one of the most powerful states in East Central Europe at the time. Commerce developed due to trade routes linking the Black Sea with Poland, Germany and the Baltic Basin. The next interesting turning point began by one of the most important and brutal moments of human history, the Mongols. By the time of the arrival of Khan hordes in 1223, the power of the Rus was in decline. It was directly related to the decline of Constantinople, a main trading partner of Kievan Rus. The trade route along which the goods were moving from the Black Sea to Eastern Europe to the Baltic had been a cornerstone of Kievan wealth and prosperity. But these trading routes became less important as the Byzantine Empire declined in power and Western Europe created new trade routes to Asia and the Near East, and so their economy suffered. As a result, Kievan Rus was not able to put up much of a fight. A full-scale invasion by Batu Khan between 1237 and 1242 forced all Rus principalities to submit, and Kievan Rus disintegrated under the pressure of the Mongol invasion, fragmenting into successor principalities who all paid tribute to the Golden Horde. Halichwohinja was one of the three most important powers to emerge from the collapse of Kievan Rus, along with Novgorod and Vladimir Suzdal. In 1246, King Daniel of Kingdom of Galicia Volhynia had been summoned to the capital of the Golden Horde and was forced to accept Mongol overlordship. Daniel was handed a cup of fermented mare's milk by the Mongol Khan Batu and told to get used to it. While formally accepting the Mongols as overlords and supplying them with soldiers as required, Daniel built a foreign policy around opposition to the Golden Horde. He established cordial relations with the rulers of Kingdom of Poland and Kingdom of Hungary and requested aid from the Pope in the form of a crusade. In return for papal assistance, Daniel offered to place his lands under the authority of Rome. Wooed by the prospect of extending his authority, the Pope encouraged Daniel's resistance to the Mongols and his western orientation, but this never materialized in any real resistance. Under these conditions, Lviv was officially founded in the year of 1256 by King Daniel, and it was named in the honor of his son Lev. In 1261, the city was invaded by Tatars. The legend told is that King Daniel was ordered to destroy his own city walls in order to show his commitment to being a vassal of the Horde, and he may have done so. After Daniel's death, his son Lev rebuilt the city around the year 1270, and choosing Lviv as his residence, 
made it the capital of Galicia Volhynia. As a major trade center, Lviv attracted German, Armenian and other merchants. The city grew quickly due to an influx of Polish people. In 1322, the bloodline tying the Principality of Galicia Volhynia to King David was severed and so the legitimacy of its throne was in question. This was used as fuel by the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland to advance claims over the region, leading to the Galicia Volhynia Wars. But after a prolonged conflict, Galicia Volhynia was divided between Poland and Lithuania and the Principality ceased to exist as an independent state. And so King Casimir III and his forces occupied Lviv in 1349. As a part of Poland and later Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the city was known as Lvov. From then on, the population was subject to attempts to polonize and Catholicize, leading to the construction of a number of cathedrals. The city's population grew rapidly and soon Lvov became a multi-ethnic and multi-religious city, as well as an important center of culture, science and trade. The city's fortifications were strengthened with Lviv becoming one of the most important fortresses with approximately 25 to 30,000 inhabitants in the early 17th century. But by the middle of the 17th century, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth started to diminish in power. In 1648, a major rebellion of self-governed Ukrainian Cossacks inhabiting the southeastern borderlands of the Commonwealth rioted against the Polish and Catholic oppression of Orthodox Ukraine. This came to be known as the Khalmitsky Uprising. It resulted in a Ukrainian request for protection from the Russian Tsar. The other blow to the Commonwealth was a Swedish invasion in 1655 known as the Deluge. During this period of decline, Lviv was besieged multiple times by Swedish forces. The Transylvanian Duke, Ottomans, Tatars, and then finally the city was captured and pillaged for the first time in its history by the armies of Charles XII of Sweden during the Great Northern War, during which a coalition led by Russia was contesting against the Swedish Empire. On August 5, 1772, Russia, Prussia and Austria signed a treaty that partitioned Poland. The agreement deprived Poland of approximately half of its population and almost one third of its land area. Subsequently, Lviv became the capital of the new Austrian province known as the Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria and was renamed Lemberg. The city grew especially during the 19th century, increasing in population from approximately 30,000 at the time of Austrian annexation to 196,000 by 1910. Over this period, many theatres and universities were built, but eventually the Austrian administration attempted to Germanize the city's educational and governmental functions, claiming that the Ukrainian and Polish influences were relatively backwards. As a result, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, a large influx of German and German-speaking Czech bureaucrats gave the city a character that by the 1840s was quite German. A rivalry developed between the new German and the older Polish and Ukrainian elites. The sanctions imposed on local culture and language culminated when revolutions of 1848 took over the Austrian Empire. Basically, a wave of nationalistic revolutions began spreading across the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Lviv was no different with the Poles and Ukrainians attempting to regain some autonomy. As a result, the university was permitted to reintroduce Ukrainian and Polish and the Galician region was given more autonomy in general. Interestingly, in 1853, Lviv became the first European city to have streetlights. Due to an innovation discovered by its residents, they introduced kerosene lamps after accidentally improving on coal-based lamps that were used prior. And in 1858, these lights were updated to gas and in 1900 to electricity. During this time, Lviv grew rapidly, becoming the fourth largest city in Austria-Hungary, according to their 1910 census. Buildings from Austrian period, such as the Opera Theatre built in the Viennese Neo-Renaissance style, still dominate and characterize much of the center of the city of today. During Habsburg rule, Lviv became one of the most important Polish, Ukrainian and Jewish cultural centers. The city granted the rights to send delegates to the imperial parliament in Vienna, drew in many prominent cultural and political leaders, and therefore served as a meeting place of Ukrainian, Polish, Jewish and German cultures. 51% of the city's population were Roman Catholics, 28% Jews and 19% belonged to the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Linguistically, 86% of the city's population used the Polish language and just 11% preferred Ukrainian. 
Lviv was home to the Polish Ossolineum, with the second largest collection of Polish books in the world, the Polish Academy of Arts, the Polish Historical Society, the Polish Theatre and Polish Archdiocese. Similarly, the city served as an important center of the Ukrainian patriotic movement and culture. Unlike in other parts of Ukraine that was under Russian rule, where publications in Ukrainian were prohibited as a part of Russification. As a result, Lviv housed the largest and most influential Ukrainian institutions in the world, and it served as the seat of Ukrainian Catholic Church. With the coming of the war, the Galicia region was contested during the Battle of Lemberg, a major conflict between Russia and Austria-Hungary during the early stages of World War I in 1914. During the course of the battle, the Austro-Hungarian armies were severely defeated and forced out of Galicia, while the Russians captured Lemberg and for approximately nine months ruled eastern Galicia. So Lviv was captured by the Imperial Russian Army in September 1914, but was retaken the following year. World War I also happened to be the main catalyst for the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a major geopolitical event which led to the re-emergence of many countries that had been under Habsburg control, including Poland, Czechoslovakia and others. In view of this collapse, the local Ukrainian population proclaimed Lviv as the capital of the West Ukrainian People's Republic on November 1, 1918, with Lviv as its capital. Proclamation of the Republic was a complete surprise for the Poles, who still made up a majority. Also, the Poles considered the territory claimed by the Ukrainians Polish. So while the Ukrainian residents enthusiastically supported the proclamation and the city's significant Jewish minority accepted or remained neutral, the Polish residents were shocked to find themselves in a new state. Immediately, the Polish majority of Lviv, a city of over 200,000 people, started an armed uprising. Poles, with their numeric superiority, took control of most of the city center. Meanwhile, the regular Polish forces reached the city on November 19, and by November 22, the Ukrainian troops were forced out. When the Polish forces captured the city, they looted and burned much of the Jewish and Ukrainian quarters of the city, killing many civilians in the process. After securing control of Lviv, Polish authorities shut down all Ukrainian institutions and societies, conducted mass arrests of Ukrainians, forced Ukrainians to work on Greek Catholic religious holidays, and dismissed most Ukrainian civil servants. Ukrainian members of the city council resigned in protest, and no Ukrainian would sit on the city council until 1927. On the 13th of November 1918, after the collapse of the Central Powers and the Armistice in 1918, Lenin's Russia started slowly moving forces in the western direction to recover and secure the lands vacated by German forces that the Russian state had lost under the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. Lenin saw the newly independent Poland as the bridge which his Red Army would have to cross to assist other communist movements and to bring about more European European socialist revolutions. At the same time, leading Polish politicians dreamed of restoring pre-1772 borders of the Commonwealth. Motivated by that idea, Polish chief of state Joseph Pilsudski began moving troops east. Pilsudski believed that the best way for Poland to secure favorable borders was by military action and that he could easily defeat the Red Army forces. His Kiev offensive, considered to have begun the Polish-Soviet war, commenced in late April 1920 and resulted in the takeover of Kiev by the Polish and Allied Ukrainian forces on 7th of May. The Red Army responded to the Polish offensive with successful counterattacks. So from the 5th of June on the southern Ukrainian front and from the 4th of July on the northern front, the Soviet operation pushed the Polish forces back all the way to Warsaw. It was on August 16th that the Red Army started an assault on Lviv. The fighting occurred with heavy casualties on both sides, but after three days the assault was halted and the Red Army retreated. This happened because of the crushing defeats of the main forces of the Red Army in the Battle of Warsaw. The Russian forces were forced to withdraw and soon sued for peace. The fall of Warsaw had seemed certain at one point, but the tide had turned after the Polish forces achieved an unexpected and decisive victory. In the wake of the eastwards Polish advance that followed, the Soviets sued for peace and the war ended with a ceasefire on 18th of October 1920. The Peace of Riga signed on 18th of March 1921 divided the disputed territories between Poland and Soviet Russia. 
The war and the treaty negotiations determined the Soviet-Polish border for the rest of the interwar period. Following the Peace of Riga, Lviv remained in Polish hands. The city which was the third biggest in Poland became one of the most important centers of science, sports and culture of Poland. During the interwar period, Lviv had grown significantly from 219,000 inhabitants in 1921 to 312,000 in 1931. Although Poles constituted a majority, Jews formed more than one-fourth of the population. The Ukrainian minority was also a sizable one. Increased Polish settlement reduced the relative percentage of Ukrainian population in the city from 20 in 1910 to less than 12% by 1931. In official documents, the Polish authorities also replaced all references to Ukrainians with the old word for Ruthenians, an action that caused many Ukrainians today to view their original self-designation with distaste. The Polish government fostered the new idea of Lviv as an Eastern Polish outpost, standing strong against Eastern hordes by suppressing Jewish and Ukrainian culture and by parading and claiming full responsibility for the military victories of Lviv's inhabitants. Nazi Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, and the German divisions reached the suburbs of Lviv on September 12, beginning a siege. The city's garrison was ordered to hold out at all costs. Also, a number of Polish troops from central Poland were trying to reach the city and organized a defense to buy time to regroup. Thus, a 10-day-long defense of the city started and later became known as yet another Battle of Lwów. Poland and the world learned the meaning of a grim new word, Blitzkrieg. It wasn't the Wehrmacht who entered the city first, however, as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was still in effect. This was a non-aggression treaty between Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, so Poland was once again crushed by the giants that surrounded it. The Soviet and Nazi forces divided Poland between themselves, and Lviv became a part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Initially, the Jewish and a part of the Ukrainian population who lived in interwar Poland cheered the Soviet takeover, whose stated goal was to protect the Ukrainian population in the area. But decolonization combined with large-scale anti-Polish actions began immediately, with huge numbers of Poles and Jews being deported eastwards into the Soviet Union. About 30,000 were deported in the beginning of 1940 alone, and a smaller percentage of the Ukrainian population was deported as well. Bad times didn't end there, however, despite the people thinking that they might be liberated when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union in June 22, 1941. Lviv's Ukrainian minority initially associated Germans with the previous Austrian times, happier for Ukrainians in comparison to the later Polish and especially Soviet periods. But in reality, the situation of the Jewish inhabitants became tragic almost immediately. Immediately, they were rushed into a newly created ghetto and then mostly sent to various German concentration camps. The Lvov ghetto was established after the initial violent pogroms and the ghetto held around 120,000 Jews, most of whom were deported to the Belzec extermination camp or killed locally during the following two years. This resulted in the almost complete annihilation of the Jewish population of Lviv. By the time that the Soviet forces returned to the ghetto town in 1944, only 200 to 300 Jews remained. The Polish and smaller Ukrainian populations of the city were also subject to harsh policies, which resulted in a number of mass executions. Amongst the first to be murdered were the professors of the city's universities and other members of Polish elite and intelligentsia. But as the war progressed and Nazi Germany retreated, the Red Army once again approached the city. On July 21, 1944, the local leadership of the Polish Home Army ordered all the Polish forces to rise in an armed uprising. And after four days of fighting, combined with the advance of the Red Army, Lviv was handed over to the Soviet Union. Despite the help of the Poles, the Soviet authorities quickly turned hostile and the genocidal Stalinist policies resumed. After the war, despite Polish efforts, the city remained as a part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. 
Joseph Stalin demanded to keep the territory, and although US President Franklin Roosevelt wanted to allow Poland to keep Lviv, him and Churchill reluctantly caved to the demands. Most of the remaining Polish population was expelled to the Polish territories gained from Germany. So the traditional ethnic composition of the city was quickly and drastically changed as the Germans and Poles left. Migrants from Ukrainian-speaking rural areas around the city as well as from other parts of the Soviet Union arrived attracted by the city's rapidly growing industry. And with Russification being a general Soviet policy in post-war Ukraine, the character of the city changed. However, after the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953, Soviet cultural policies were relaxed, allowing Lviv to become a major hub of Ukrainian culture. In the 1950s and 1960s, the city significantly expanded, both in population and size. A number of prominent plants and factories were established or moved from eastern parts of the USSR. This resulted in partial Russification of the city and some loss of its western flavor. In the period of Soviet liberalization in the 1980s until the early 1990s, the city became the center of people's movement of Ukraine, a political movement advocating Ukrainian independence from the USSR. And finally, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, Lviv became part of the newly independent Ukraine, serving as the capital of the Lviv Oblast. Today, the city remains one of the most important centers of Ukrainian cultural, economic and political life, and is noted for its beautiful and diverse architecture and a truly impressively rich and fascinating history. And while the economy of Ukraine as a whole is currently undergoing shrinkage due to the conflict in the East, the outlook for the city of Lviv is one of optimism. Tourism, despite the pandemic, remains strong and the IT industry is booming. All in all, Lviv may be one of the most comfortable and best places to live or visit in the country. This is the Patreon map. All my long-term patrons get added to this map. Pick a location and an icon that best represents you. Also, have a look at geoperspective.org as I like creating maps and posters. It's really one of the best ways to support me. Now, have a guess where this shot was taken by leaving a comment and I will see you soon. Geoperspective out.